We're joined now uh, by Tulip Sadiq. She is the Shadow Treasury Minister. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, just before we get on to that, um, I just wanted to get your view on what Oliver Dowden was just saying at the end of the uh, interview about his view that a woke ideology is effectively corrosive and that we should be proud of this country's history. What's your take on that? Well, I thought the quote that you stated from him at the start was ridiculous, and I think he should have explained it better, but I can see why he decided not to. Look, of course I agree with the fact that we shouldn't go and rip down statues, but there is real anger there because some of the statues and some of the history relates to a very dark past for us. Let's say slave masters or people who feel like we haven't acknowledged what role people had to play in sacrificing. So I think name changes after a consultation with community makes sense. But it's also about, it's not just about name calling, it's also about the fact that people feel their voices haven't been heard, their points of view haven't been heard. I think we have to be quite respectful of the debate. Of course, I don't want people to be violent when it comes to it. But I also think Oliver Dowden needs to think very carefully about the fact that for years and years, history was taught in a way that airbrushed a lot of the atrocities that took place and that a lot of people felt that their part of history hadn't been acknowledged. So, for example, locally, mm -hmm. Beckford Primary School have just changed their name to West Hampstead Primary School. And all the children know why. They know why the history of the school wasn't appropriate, why the name wasn't appropriate. It wasn't done in a way where why, people Why is went, that then, to people who may not... Be because it was it was someone associated with the slave trade and they didn't want to do that in a community like ours which is very diverse people felt that they wanted to be named in the local area as West Hampstead and not refer to a name that was put in the past but I do find um, some of the attitude around this has become quite un unhelpful and corrosive as well and not taking in other people's points of view okay well interesting to hear both sides uh, of the debate there uh, today Labour wants to focus on the cost of living uh, you're calling for an emergency budget just to explain what the idea of that is so, Sophie, as you said, I am a Shadow Treasury Minister, but I'm also a constituency MP, and I've been taken aback and, frankly speaking, alarmed by the number of people coming to my advice surgeries, talking about the fact that they can't afford the basic food that they want to buy for their children. I have women coming to my surgery on Friday saying, I'm dreading the weekend because I can't feed my children. They can't afford to put on the heating. Things are really bad. They can't, I mean, let alone affording petrol. They literally can't buy basic food items and clothes for their children. So we're very worried. We're very worried that this national insurance hike is going to hit people's pay packets this week. We're very worried about the fact that there weren't enough measures mentioned in the spring statement on the 23rd of March to meet some of the challenge of the cost of living crisis that's taking place right now. So from the Labour Party, we've said that we want to put forward an emergency budget which we want the Chancellor to adopt. OK, I just want to read you the first line of the press release. This was sent by Labour uh, to journalists about the emergency budget idea. Following another week of the Conservatives focusing on their internal strife, Labour's calling on the government to introduce an emergency budget. I mean, that's a bit rich, isn't it? I mean, it was Labour who's been focusing on Partygate, isn't it? I mean, that's what Keir Starmer asked about at Prime Minister's Questions. It was Labour who put down the motion for MPs to vote on whether the PM misled the House. I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not getting into the debate about whether it's right or wrong to focus on Partygate, but I'm just saying you can't exactly accuse the Conservatives as being the ones that's focusing on this, can you? The Prime Minister who holds the highest office in our country, he was in charge of looking after the country when the coronavirus hit, broke the rules and lied to Parliament. I understand why you're focusing on it, but I'm just saying that you have to admit that you're focusing on it, don't you, rather than saying, oh, it's the Conservatives who've been distracted I don't by think this. it's either or. I think you can talk about Partygate, and I think we're going to discuss that later on, but I just want to go on to why we think the emergency budget is so important at this point in time, Sophie. The things we're calling for in the emergency budget, for a start, is the windfall tax, which I'm sure you've heard about. We're saying that we should tax oil and gas producers' profits and we should make sure that we take around £600 pounds yeah. off energy bills. You, Labour we, yeah, we, frequently talk about the, the windfall tax. We've talked about businesses as well. So I would challenge any MP, Oliver Dowden was just here, but any MP that you speak to, to take a walk in their constituency and speak to local businesses and ask them if they're struggling or not. So we're saying that we have to give a tax break to businesses, especially to SMEs. Is this, is this an admission that perhaps voters actually want Labour to move on from focusing on party gate and to talk about the cost of living? Well, of course we want to talk of the, about the cost of living crisis. Of course we do, because it's such a real threat to people. And I've mentioned the willful tax. I've mentioned the fact that we have to focus on giving tax breaks to uh, businesses, especially SMEs, and we're talking about that at the moment. I've talked about the fact that we've got to make sure we halt the national insurance rise that's happening at the moment. 
Also, the fraud, which I should really mention, National Crime Agency, we've asked them to look into the fact that there's 11.8 billion pounds worth of fraud that happened during the COVID schemes, and no one in the government seems to be talking about that. 11.8 billion pounds is not an insignificant figure when it comes to fraud and crime. Why weren't the basic facts in check? Why weren't they checking the fact that duplicate loan forms had been given in? So we've got to look at that. And the final thing we're asking for is that we have to have a rapid program, a proper program to look into how we insulate homes okay. so that we can actually take money off people's energy bills. OK. Now, you've been very involved in the campaign to free Nazanin Zaghari at Ratcliffe. You're a constituent who was, of course, imprisoned in Iran. She's now safely back home with her family that I'm sure we're all extremely thankful for. Now, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee uh, have said that they want to have an investigation and inquiry uh, into how the government handled uh, this. Now, they, they announced this at the beginning of the April, um, but today's now the 24th of April. Is there any sign about when that's actually going to get going? So the minute Nazneen came home, um, Richard Radcliffe, her husband, and I said there has to be an inquiry into why this didn't happen sooner. She was away for six years, and we know for a fact there was a few missed opportunities when the government could have brought her back and they didn't. So I asked Tom Tugendhat and I wrote to him and said, look, you've got to in conduct an inquiry into this, not just because of Nazneen, but to sh make sure it doesn't happen again in the future and the general policy of hostage-taking by Iran. And um, they wrote back a few days later and said they were going to conduct this inquiry. I haven't heard much about it, but I do know that I want the inquiry to go ahead to find out why there were so many missed opportunities about bringing Nazneen home, to make sure it doesn't happen again. But also, there's a very important incident that happened in 2013, where three British officials came to the UK. They were detained in Heathrow Airport and put in a detention centre. And they actually came, apparently, to negotiate the repayment of this debt. And Druck Straw said to me, he has never got to the bottom of why this happened and why they were arrested and detained and why we never did anything about it. So, are you worried that this inquiry might be being kicked into the long grass? Because obviously it could be quite awkward for the government, couldn't it? It could be potentially very awkward for the government and it could also um, unearth some of the th missed opportunities and wh why we didn't bring her back home earlier. I mean, six years is a very long time. I hope the inquiry takes place. I'll certainly be holding the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Do you get a sense that it's been kicked into the long grass? Well, I'm a bit worried I haven't heard anything about it, and yeah. I feel like more should be made. Of course, there's a lot going on in politics and the cost of living crisis that we've just been talking about, Partygate. But at the same time, I don't want to lose focus on it, and I think it's what Nazanin, my constituent, deserves. Uh, we've got the French elections, of course, uh, coming up later on. Uh, today, I'll be uh, heading to Paris uh, after the show to present from there. Would the Labour government, if a Labour government, I should say, rather than the Labour government, would a Labour government be comfortable working with Marine Le Pen, who is a far right leader? I should start off by saying I hope that is a situation that doesn't arise. Uh, but if it does come, I mean, I suppose what we have to do is do the best we can, as in the government worked with Trump when he was elected. You probably know he had some views that we didn't always accept. Some of the views about Muslims especially weren't ones that we wanted to take place. So I guess as a responsible government, you have to work with any government. I do hope, though, Sophie, can I just say, that the result goes in a different direction. OK, uh, pretty clear what uh, you mean there. Uh, right, just finally, I just want to ask about this story uh, in the middle on Sunday. Uh, this is about uh, Angela Rayner. I also spoke to Oliver Dowden about it earlier in the, show, in the show, but I think we can show the picture there. Uh, this is uh, the accusation that Angela Rayner is using basic instinct ploy to distract Boris Johnson at Prime Minister's questions, by which it feels like she is just sitting across from him uh, in order to distract him. Um, given the kind of allegations in the Sunday Times today about the fact that uh, there are these alleged reports of sexual harassment going into the watchdog, what would you say about the culture uh, in Westminster uh, when it's with regards to women MPs? I, I feel like I can't even read and look at this front page. That's why I was looking away, because I think the story is so disgraceful. And I actually am quite upset because I heard what Oliver Dowden said, and I think he should have been stronger in condemning this. At the end of the day, Angela Rayner is an MP who got elected on merit to talk about the fact that she's using her legs or her posture to manipulate the Prime Minister is ridiculous. I'm really upset about it. I'm also very upset, Sophie, about these allegations that there's more stories coming out of MPs abusing their position for sexual favours or to manipulate staff and all the accusations that are coming up. I don't care which party the MPs are from. If, 
it, there has to be an independent review, there has to be an independent panel that looks into this. If there are people from my party, there should be a zero tolerance to this. If it's, if it's people from the government, there should be a zero tolerance. We've got to wake, make Westminster more welcoming for female MPs, but also staff members as well. I mean, a question I regularly get when I get to schools is, is Westminster very abusive for women? I mean, is that the kind of rhetoric we want to be heard? And Would you say that it is or not? Well, you know, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place because I don't want to put determined, in interesting women off politics. But the truth is that we've got to tackle all these challenges that are coming up. But can I just make a point about Partygate? Because we didn't talk about that. One of my main worries is not just that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor is taking their eye off the cost of living crisis while they're trying to save their own skin. My other worry is that what kind of message does that send out to the public that we are meant to be the authority that makes legislation? People hate politicians anyway, and they're losing further okay. faith in us. Next time there's a pandemic or something like this happens, the public won't listen because they made huge sacrifices during the pandemic, and the Prime Minister okay. carried on and then lied to Parliament. OK. Uh, Boris Johnson, of course, would say that he didn't lie to uh, Parliament. Important for me to put that uh, point uh, across. But thank you very much for your time uh, today, Chilip Good to talk.